this, this challenge to live by faith. Because what we're doing is we're doing this, this one campaign. And in fact, you should have received a one campaign guide. There's a book that's out on the counter right outside these doors. And it explains what we're walking through. We have three initiatives that we are raising money for over the next two years. We're believing God for $1.1 million to come in. Here's what we're going to do with that money. The first one is for our mission. There are, the, within Broome County, 90% of the people in Broome County do not have a life-giving relationship with Jesus Christ. And so we are looking to fund our mission. That's the first point is we're going to fund our mission to reach the 90%. It's really probably closer to 92%. And so what we need to do is we're going to, we're going to be starting a hope home, on another hope home. We have a men's home and a women's home in, at, in Endicott. And we're going to start a Binghamton Hope Home where people can come in off the streets if they're homeless, if they're addicted to drugs, and we're going to begin to minister to them. And we would like to say that it's an addiction recovery program, but really it's a discipleship program. It, the idea is that when you come into a relationship with Jesus, your life is transformed. So, so the number one solution to a sin problem is Jesus. So we're going to start a men's hope home. We're going to, we're also out of budget. We're going to begin to fund all of our children's ministry, and we're going to be funding other initiatives and things like Royal Family Kids Camp. We're going to this this next summer. We are sponsoring a camp for foster care children, right here from. from there's one of the directors over there, a little excited about that. And, and so we're taking kids that, that have been abused and neglected, and we're going to give them the best week of their life. We're going to tell them about the love of a father that will never leave them. And a God that no matter what happens with their, with their earthly fathers, with their earthly parents, we have a heavenly father that will never leave us and will never forsake us. So we're going to just love on the orphans in our, in our community in that way. And so, so that's the first part of the mission. The second, the second one is for our city. We are looking to purchase a facility out in, uh, on Webb Road. It's the former Vestal Hills Country Club. And we're going we're gonna to transform that into a church building. What I like to say is a church is never a facility. It's always the people. We don't need a facility to do church, but a facility will help us. There's a whole bunch of things. <laughs> oh, a bunch of people that are here setting up this morning. They're like, Amen. Amen, amen, amen. And, and so, so there's, there's a whole bunch of things that we would like to be able to do, like have a daily discipleship program. There's a whole bunch of people that are here that need to be in a worship setting on a daily basis. Like, you know, by the time you get home, it's going to go south. Like, it was good to go to church today, but I need some more church tomorrow. And you know that's, that we need, a, we need the ability to help really kind of stir up what people are doing. And, and so we need to be able to meet on a regular basis and have some, some facility access to be able to do that. And then we are, we have started a, uh, we are going to be starting a school of ministry. And so that's actually the, for our world, the third point of this, this campaign. We are, we are starting a church planning initiative. In fact, God in the last several months has given us locations in Cortland and in Corning and we are believing God for a church planting movement. And what's going to happen is we're going to launch in Cortland and in Corning brand new church plants. And then we're going to probably do a couple of other church locations that are yet to be determined. But we have a, a church planner and residency program that's already started. There's 12 people that have felt the call of God in their life. There's a whole bunch of people at Two Rivers that have said, I feel like God is calling me to take the next step, and they're, they're looking to get their education, and we're going to help provide all of that. And so over the next two years, what we have asked people to do is to think about what God would have you give, and then in your seat today, you, you should have found in your welcome packet this little two-year commitment card. I'm going to kind of walk us through this. We've, we've done this on the screen, but here's one of the things that, that we do. Is I recognize that if you have never given before, it's like, holy cow, this guy's trying to talk about raising a million dollars, and I'm, I'm like, 
like Lexi, look, I'm giving for the very first time. And so what we want to ask you to do is I want you to find out kind of where you're at on the generosity pathway and then just kind of take one step. Like I, I, it's a faith step, no matter where you're at, to take one step forward in the process. So last week we talked about what it might be to be an initial giver. Like, hey, if you've never given before, I want to challenge you to give one time or begin giving. If, you, if you've given a few times throughout the year, I want to challenge you to become a consistent giver. If, if you have kind of, you're, you're giving, but you, you haven't really given by setting your budget intentionally, I want to challenge you to become an intentional giver. If you are somebody that's an intentional giver, but I, I want to challenge you to take and start asking the question, what am I not giving and why? So you, like everybody is taking one more step. And then the kingdom giver is somebody who just said, I've reoriented my entire life around commit, like giving to the kingdom. And this is somebody who has the ability to buy that car or that house and says, I'm not going to do it because I want to use that for the kingdom. And so somebody who gets to that place is like, I'm, they're all the way in. They're just, everything they do is centered around furthering the gospel. And so what I want us to do is that here's kind of this, this two-year goal and what it, where you might fit on this chart. I'm really not going to take time on that right now. But what I want to talk about is creative ways to give. So if on your, on your kind of commitment card here, and I, hey, welcome. If you're a guest here and you're just testing us out like, hey, uh, first off, we're in the middle of this campaign, and, and so there's no pressure for you. You're like dating us. Like, hey, just take it, just breathe easy for the next couple of minutes. And uh, this is kind of like housekeeping, because at some point we need to take a step of faith. We're going to talk about that a little bit more today, but just breathe easy for the next couple of minutes. This is really, really for the, the people that say, hey, the Two Rivers is my home. And this is where I belong. And so so what I want to talk to people about is on, on this to your commitment card, it says uh, there's a line after you figure out what you might be able to give out of your salary, like what you might be able to give out of your regular giving. So, so can, yeah, can you back it up one slide? Let's back it up one slide. Yeah, right up here. So like right here, my gifts from resources. And, and so, so that's the... Uh, I used to be a children's pastor, and I would, I would do this thing called BGMC, a Boys and Girls Missionary Challenge, and, and I would raise funds with our kids to support missionaries. Now, the funny thing about kids is that none of them have jobs. So we would, we would challenge these kids, and I'd be like, hey, let's, let's figure out what you think God might be challenging you to give, and then let's do that. And so the kids, would they'd, they'd begin to pray, and they'd be like, ah, oh, I don't have any money, I can't give anything. And, and so what we had to do was help kids to discover that they do have money, and they do have access to money, and what they had to discover was how could they leverage that for the kingdom of God. And so what I want to do is I want to take just a couple of minutes for us to kind of think through, because I believe that this, this kind of... My gifts from resources requires a little bit of creative thinking because like when my wife and I have been talking about, hey, what are we going to do for the one campaign when we pledge next Sunday, we've been having this discussion at our house and, and the discussion has almost always revolved around our salary. So kind of the way that the discussion goes, we're like, here's what's coming in, here's what's going out, what can we do, how can we move some things around? How can we increase our income? How can we decrease our expenses? What, what does it look like for us to be able to give generously to this campaign? And it, almost all of it has surrounded like the idea of, of, of our salary capacity. But I, I think there's some creative ways. So if you don't have a salary, I want to give you some options for how we can think about what it would look like to give. Because if kids can do it, I know we can. And so here's, here's one of the ways you, we can practice priority budgeting. So it, this, is, this is a matter of rearranging our current budget in order to give more to a generosity initiative. So, so that might mean postponing a planned expenditure. So like if you're thinking, I'm, I'm going to buy a new car, what if by faith you're just saying, okay, I'm going to wait on that and, and I'm just going to pause that for two years. Not that I'm not going to get a new car, I'm just going to wait for two years 
to do that. Or another example of that, a little bit different, is redirect present expenditures. So, like, if you're thinking, wow, we've kind of maxed it out and, and our budget is totally tight, one of the things that, that you could think about doing is, is, like, at some point, maybe six months from now, a lot of us, we take out these six months, no interest type of loans. Has anybody got one of those? Like, come on, I know I'm not the only one. Don't, like, pastor's going to try to make me give up my money from my loan now. It's a, it's a credit card, right? So, so at, the, at some point, that's going to go away during the next two years. And so what if you would just say, hey, I'm going to, once that, like, TV that I bought from Best Buy is paid off, I'll just continue that same payment into the one fund. Or, like, if you have a cable bill, you might say, look, for the next two years, we're not going to have cable. And that'll free up 100 bucks a month, like something along those lines. Uh, number three is increased giving with increased income. So uh, at some point in the next two years, you might get a raise. And what, one of the ways that you could be challenged is like, hey, I know my budget is tight, so keep your budget tight. And then it, as the raise comes in, rather than going out and like I'm going to, because we'll, oftentimes what do we do? We know we got a raise coming in, so what do we do? We spend more. So, so what, one of the ways that you could think about it is, okay, I know I'm going to get a raise. I'm going to live on my current level of income, and I'm going to give the rest of that to God for the next two years. So number four is give from your excess. You might have things that, are, that have been saved up, and you're planning on buying a boat or buying some vacation type of thing or whatever that looks like. And so there's, there's options to say, you know what, I might be radical in my generosity and give in that way. And, and, and so there's a whole bunch of stories I've heard of people who have, who have kind of like I've said, like, I, I was going to do this with this money, and now I'm going to reorient it around the kingdom of God for the next two years, and then commit unexpected cash. So this is, a, this is a fun one. Like, I don't know where my money's coming in, but you might say, hey, over the next two years, every time I get money in the mail, like, I, I get direct deposit, but if it comes in the mail, that all belongs to God. That's pretty, that's pretty scary. Can it, like, start thinking about how that goes, but that's, a, that's an opportunity to give above and beyond toward the one campaign. Number six, sacrifice your extra time. Especially, this is a great one for once somebody's retired and they have kids that are out of the home and they might consider, you know what, I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to retire yet. This is like my mother and father. My dad's reached retirement age and he just keeps, he keeps driving bus to give that money away. Like they, they, they have reached a place where, where they are trying to think about, they've reoriented their lives around how do I, how do I live generously with my life? And so that's like they keep, they literally, like if you talk to them, they'll, they'll tell you, hey, we, we're, we're doing all of this so that we can bless people. Number seven, this is donate appreciated assets. This is kind of where you have stocks and bonds and you might, if you had to cash that stock in, you would take a penalty on it, but there's a way to give that to the church. You would get it. Uh, the penalty wouldn't be occurred, and you'd actually get a tax write-off, and so it's a great way for you to think about giving. So in all of that, I want to uh, just challenge us for next week. I want you to prepare your heart and your mind, and I want you to know that every one of us, I am really gunning for 100% participation. Because God is going to change something in our hearts and our lives as we step out in faith. And that's what we've been talking about through this entire series. That's what we'll be we've been talking about in our small groups. And I have been enjoying our small group sessions, loving our time as we gather together. And our group is busting at the seams. We're going to have to kick people out of our group, start your own groups, and go... <laughs> so, we, we literally, we had like 43 people at our house, and it's time to, it's, look, if you want to join our group, it's going to be awesome. Just, just get ready to get close. Um, all right, so here we are in part four. It's called, this week we're going to be talking about letting go. So the moment we've been talking through this whole series about getting to the ledge and looking down, and all of a sudden, when you start looking down, you're like, what have I done? Like, you, you get that fear that comes in, and 
And you're, you know, because when you're on the ground and you're looking up at the cliff, you think, I'm going to go jump into that water. I see other people jumping in the water. That looks like a lot of fun. When it, like you've been at the pool and there's the high diving board and you see kids doing like flips and diving into the water like that, I'm going to go do that. And then you climb up the steps. Like some of us, like if you're like me, I don't even get to the top before I freeze. Like I didn't get off the steps. It didn't even take me. <laughs> what am I doing? I've frozen on the climb up before. So you get to this, and you get to this moment where you're on the ledge, and then what we want to talk about today is the jump. It's that moment when you let go and you're like you get you jump out of the plane, and now you're in free fall, and you've let go of control. You no longer have the control anymore. Like it's like God, you better show up now. And I want you to know there is power in letting go. There's a bunch of power. So here's what I want to do today. I want you to turn in your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 22. We're going to begin at verse 1. If you have your digital devices, if you came, I know some of us in the room are like hardcore old school. You better have it on paper just in case there's a digital attack. And somehow they come and they they. Like, you can download the Bible onto your phone. You guys know that. But, but so, like, they're like, if they steal the Bible from the Internet, then, then you want to have that hard copy there with you. And so, so any, way you, any way you do it, read with me from Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. It says, sometime later, God tested Abraham. Everybody say tested. God tested Abraham. We're going to talk about that. Hear a little bit more as we go on. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then, then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain. I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had enough when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey. Will I and the boy go over there? We will worship and then we'll come back down to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the Two of them went on together. Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? In verse 8, Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. Verse 9, when they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. Finishing up now in verses 15 through 18. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven, a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Let's take a moment 
bow our heads and pray. Jesus, I thank you for this moment. I thank you for what you want to do in our lives. I pray that you would speak to us now, that the word of God would not be silent, but it would cut to the quick every one of our hearts, that we would discover the power of letting go, following you, putting our trust in the one whom will never fail. In Jesus' mighty name, everyone said, amen. Amen. So we are going to talk today, if you're taking notes, you can write this down. This is the big idea. Surrender means trusting God and letting go of the outcomes. We'll be talking about that in our small groups this week. In week number four, surrender means trusting God and letting go of the outcomes. There is power in letting go. Now, if oftentimes in life we go through disappointments, like if, if you were praying that and standing in faith and believing that God would heal someone and, and, and then God didn't show up to heal them, or maybe it was that, that you were working very hard to get a promotion at work and you didn't get that promotion, Maybe you were believing God for a relationship and really standing in faith for that relationship and the relationship crashed and burned. We get to the place where we have disappointment and once, once we get burned, once we're disappointed, we can tend to feel like, like if we stay here, if I hold on to this disappointment, if I hold on to that thing that I wanted, that I was believing God for, that thing, that, that bitterness can set in, and, and your heart can start to say, you know what, I, I'm not going to trust God anymore. We can, we, it's very easy for us to get to that place in our life where, where we've been hurt and we've been disappointed, and, and because after we've stepped out in faith, we just we decide, I'm, I, you know what, I can't, I can't do that anymore. And so what, what has to happen and what we are talking about today is this power of letting go, of standing in faith and saying, God, I trust you. I don't understand. I don't understand why that happened to me. But I know that you are a good God and that that you are going to work things out somehow in my favor. And so the power of letting go is, is this question that you and I, really, it brings us to this big question is, will you trust him to do it his way? It reminds me of this story about a mountain climber who was on a really dangerous section of the mountain and, and there was a cliff edge that really had no cliff holes and, and, he, and he slipped and fell and as he was falling down this cliff edge, he reached out and kind of miraculously grabbed a hold of a, of a tree that was hanging out the side of the mountain. And as he's dangling off this tree, he, he yells up, is there anyone up there? And he hears a voice from heaven that say, yes, I'm here. And he says, well, well, could you help me get down from here? And the voice from heaven says, yes, I can. Let go and I will catch you. And the mountain climber paused for a second. And he said, is there anyone else up there? <laughs> we will oftentimes... Like, we, we'll, we'll trust in God as long as God does it our way. Right? right? Like, I, I'll, I'll listen to you, God, when, when you do things my way. I remember last, it was like last year, we were, we were looking to close on a building on, on Clinton Street. We were looking to buy the, the flower shop on Clinton Street, and we were going to retrofit that and convert that and use that as our church facility. And I... 
like, I, I would go there and I'd march around. And I'd, I'd like do the Jericho march thing. I'd read like Joshua and every place you set your foot, it belongs to you. And I'd go down there and I'd walk around the, I'd walk around the whole block. It was a long block. And I'd be like, every place I set my foot belongs to Jesus. This building is going to be ours. We're going to tear it down and we're going to get a great deal on this building. And God's going to provide for us as a church. And I know everybody's tired of setting up and tearing down. And so Jesus, you're, I'd go down and I'd, like when nobody's kind of looking, I'd look around. And I'd be like, I'd put my hands on the walls. Be like, this place is going to be filled with the people that are going to be transformed. And I put like, and the presence of God is going to anoint this place. And I'd be walking around it and I'd, I'd be doing all my thing. Believe in God for this facility. And we started going through the process and it looked like things were lining up for us to buy the building. And, and then we got to the zoning. <laughs> the moment where the zoning was supposed to go through with the city of Binghamton, and one of, the, one of the local businessmen who had said that we could use their place for parking reversed course the week before the zoning meeting. I was like, are you kidding me? Everything fell apart. Like everything was going in one direction. And then it all fell apart. And I was like, oh, we had already had a vote to gather people together. And, and like, hey, we're going to go into this place. We had drawings. We had workups, we had all kinds of stuff. We had invested all kinds of money into that to get to that point. And then it all came unraveled and I was like, oh, God, what happened? And so sometimes we, got it, we get to this place where, where we have these disappointments where we're standing in faith and we, we get to the point where like, I, I tried that once before. I tried to stand in faith. I tried this idea of jumping and I did it and I got burned and it didn't feel good. And, and when we get to that place, we start saying, you know, I, I don't know about all of this. And so what I, we've got to do is I want to encourage you to stand in faith, believing that God sees down ahead of you. Like, I don't know everything around that. All I know is Look, when God closes a door, he opens up another one. There's some things that you can't see that you think you've been praying for and believing God for. And he said, look, if I give that to you, you're going to miss my best for your life. And so, so we, there is this, this thing that God does, but who is doing it? It's God that does it, Right? Like God has to say, here's the direction that we go in and here's how you walk. And if you would be willing to say, hey, I'm going to, I know I did, things didn't go that way. I'm going to take my hands off the wheel. You know, Carrie Underwood, Jesus, take the wheel. I'll sing that for you, but that was as close as you're going to get. I had a pastor, I'm, I got to pause for a second because I can't talk about Carrie Underwood, Jesus, take the wheel. We'll talk about talking about Pastor Russ Allen, one of our the church I used to be on staff at, Pastor Russ always had Jesus take the wheel as his ringtone, and he never could shut it off. Like he was in his 50s, he didn't quite understand, like you, there's a silence button on your phone. So the staff, we would love to get to a quiet moment in the church service, and we would call his phone. <laughs> <laughs> and then you'd hear Russ, you'd hear Jesus take the wheel singing out like he's always fumbling. He could never find it. And we would just be laughing so hard. And pastor would be so mad. Like, what are you guys doing screwing up the service? And it's like Russ's fault. It's Russ's fault. He doesn't turn his phone off. It's just, sorry. It's a, like, Jesus take the wheel, right? You got to get that moment where, where you just decide, I'm going to trust him. I'm gonna, if, if, and you got to have this, this in my heart that God is good. And that's really where Abraham's at as we get into this, into this story in Genesis chapter 22. It says, sometime later, God tested Abraham. You know, testing in your life and in my life is, is meant from God to promote us. 
See, what, what has to happen is God is looking in your heart and God is discovering out of your heart what it is that you're holding on to. And, and, and he wants to know that you're totally and completely trusting in him. Because, because there are ev at every level, as God promotes you, the things that you're holding on to will be exposed and I've seen leader after leader after leader who are destroyed because they're holding on to things that are not God. And so every step of the way, as God is releasing blessing into their life, he is trying to make sure, hey, don't let the thing that I blessed you with become the thing that you worship. Like it's easy for us to he, like, God wants to know, hey, you're not following me for the things that I give you. So many people are, are, are here for the hand of God, and they miss the face of God. Like, they want what God can give, but they don't want God. And so God, in his graciousness in our life, gives us the things that we pray for and then we desire, but God wants our hearts. He wants our heart. And so, so what's happening is the devil will come to tempt you to destroy you. The devil puts things in your life because he's like, hey, if I can get you to hold on to that, you, I want you to worship that thing. That's how the devil tempted Jesus. He brought Jesus, he showed him all the kingdoms, kingdoms of the world. And he said, look, if you just bow down and worship me, you can have all of this. You can have all the stuff, you can have all the fame, you can have all the honor, you can have everything. And Jesus recognized that you don't get to that by bowing down and worshiping created things. See, Jesus had kingdom and dominion and authority of all of that. And so he was never going to submit in that way. And so, so God tests us in order to promote us. So here's the, here's the thing that, that we discover out of this text is that what we hold on to reveals what or who we trust. So like when you get ready to jump out of an airplane, what do you hold on to? Somebody. <laughs> well, when you jump out, you're holding on to the parachute, Right? Like, I trust this parachute is going to get me to the ground. Like, I'm holding on to that. If you didn't, if you didn't jump out with a parachute, we got to talk. Like, we're probably not going to talk. But, but if you're going to jump, it's because you trust that that parachute is going to hold you. See, the thing that you're holding on to reveals what you trust. And so here's Abraham, and God comes to test Abraham. And God wants to know, what are you holding on to, Abraham? Because if you're trusting in me, you're going to hold on to me. And the thing that I gave you, the thing that's your heart desire, because Abraham, like this is almost a joke that God comes to Abraham and calls him the father of many nations because Abraham at that time, when God says that, is he, he and his wife, they're barren, like Sarah can't have kids. They're in their 90s, like late in life, no children. God says you're going to be the father of many nations. Like, you want to talk about unlikely. Like, if you were going to, like, I've got friends that have, like, 15 kids. Like, they have the van full, like the 15-passenger van they load them all in. So that would be the kind of person you'd go to and be like, God promises that you would have many, like you will have nations that will come out of you. Like, I know that. I know, I know, because I take care of all of these kids. And I, it's already happening. I understand that God, like this thing is going to multiply like crazy. You don't go to the person that's barren and say, hey, you're the one that's going to be the father of many nations. Like, uh-uh. And so God goes to this unlikely person and he tells him, and, and then he gives him like, in his old age, here's his son. The answer to his prayer, the thing that he has all, like coveted and longed for his whole life, 
And now God says, hey, I want you to take him. I want you to sacrifice him. And God's going to discover what Abraham is holding on to. What we hold on to reveals what or who we trust in. And I remember just recently, so it's not that long ago, it's not hard for me to remember this. My father-in-law passed away just a month or so ago, two months ago. And he had cancer. And we, Crystal and I and, and our whole family, we're praying and we're believing God. Like, God, you will heal my father-in-law. It's, it'll be too early if he goes now. He's just getting to the age where he can retire. He's just getting, and I got a lot of plans for him. Like, we're going to go into a facility. He's going to be our maintenance guy. Like, he's a handyman. We need him. God, you got to heal him so I can put him to work. A lot of, a lot of other good reasons <laughs> to have my father-in-law around. <laughs> like, we love him. And... And so, so in, in the midst of that, though, he died. Cancer claimed his life. And so, so it's like you go into a season of mourning, and you're like, God, what, what were you thinking? Like, how did this happen? What? And, and you start to hold on to that disappointment, and, and you're going to go through a season of mourning. But what happens is, the question is, what are you holding on to? Because I think oftentimes we get to these big life disappointments where we have been saying, God, I need you to come through and I need this to happen and, and God, I want you and, and I, where are you, God? And, and what happens is these, these big disappointments we hold on to and what should be a season of grieving becomes a lifetime of grief. Do we hold on to that? We don't ever, at some point, we have to let it go and we have to be able to say, God, I trust you, that you know better than I know. And this is really deep because it's like, my wife and I, we had this child who was born and had a, a rare condition and died after 13 days, and you say, God, how, how could sickness, like he's a, a baby, how could this happen? Like it's not fair, how could, how could that drunk driver run into that person over there? The drunk driver walks away, the other person is dead. How does this work, God? What, like, like I don't understand it, and so when people say like, hey, I, like, this person gets healed of cancer and the person next to him doesn't. And I, like, they, people ask me, like, why is that? And I'm gonna give you a deep theological answer. Everybody lean in. I don't know. Right? I don't know. I'm not God. At some point, we have to let go. And trust that God has a better plan, that God is going to take those evil things that happen in our life and turn them around for good, that there is somehow a just God in an unjust world who is working to bring about something good on our behalf, that, that there is never a moment, there's never been a pain, there's never been a burden in your life that God hasn't seen and won't repay. And so we have to say, look, God, I'm letting go of this thing, I'm letting go of this grief. I'm letting go of this disappointment and I'm going to trust in you that you're going to redeem it you're going to bring something good out of it and that this is not the end and that's what God wants to do and so, so we have to, to ask this question what are we holding on to so early the next morning Abraham got up and loaded his donkey he took with him his two servants and his son Isaac and they head out and they get up to the mountain, and as they leave the servants behind, this is really interesting. Most theologians believe that, that Isaac, at this point, is at least a teenager, if not in his 30s. And so it's, he says, like, it sounds like, it talks about, like, the boy and son and all that kind of stuff, but based on the age of Sarah... They're saying it's probably likely that he's in his teens or 20s, if not in his 30s. And so here's Isaac 
as they're walking up the mountain. And he says, okay, dad, like we've done this before. We, we've done this thing before, and I know how this works. We're going up to do a sacrifice. Where's the sacrifice? Like, I did the math. There's the fire in the wood. No sacrifice. And this is what happens in our life. This is what we start to hold on to. This is what, because we're trying to figure out, like Isaac, we're trying to make sense of it. We're trying to, like, if because I'll follow God when God does it my way. I'll follow God. Look, I'm going to jump when it makes sense to me. When everything lines up the way I think it ought to line up, I will jump. But God has this scenario, and we're caught in this scenario like Isaac, like, I don't understand this thing right now. And what we do is we put a question mark where God put a period. Did, did you put a question mark where God put a period? See, all those questions like, like God, what, what about that child that dies? What about... The, the things that go wrong in my life, how, like, hey, how did all these things happen? And, and we have to get to the place where, where it's like, okay, God wants you to put a period at some point. We got to move on. And if, we, if we're trying to make sense of it and work it all out and we got it in our heart, head like I got to do it just this way. In fact, the Bible says in Proverbs, it says that God directs your steps so stop trying to figure out his plan. Like this is literally what it says in Proverbs. I think it's 2024. And so, so did I put a question mark where God put a period? If you would be willing to jump, if you would be willing to let go, if you would be willing to say, God, I don't understand it. I, I, don't, I, I don't have to understand it all. I know that, that you're going to do something good in my life. I'm going I'm to believe in you. I'm going to trust in you. And something good is going to come out of this thing. And this is what Abraham says. Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb. Now, here's my thing about this answer that Abraham has. There's no way Abraham can answer that except that he knows God. Like, you're not, gonna, you're not even getting to this, point, this moment unless you know God. Because Abraham started hearing God's voice a long time before that. God said to Abraham, I want you to go to a land that I will show you. And so Abraham's off walking, and God's like, hey, I want you to go here. Now I want you to go here. Now I want you to go here. Now I want you to go here. And the thing with God, why, why we have to like begin to, to trust in him and who he is, and why we got to understand that where there's a period, don't add the question mark because God's process isn't A, B, C. Like in, in my world, A, B, C makes a lot of sense. Like God, if you just understood, we set up the alphabet, A, B, C. And oftentimes the way God does it, he goes, okay, A, Z, T, back to V. Now we're gonna go to B. Oh, we made it to step two. Like, that's what we're thinking. Like, oh, I made it to step two. No. <laughs> like, hey, like Joseph, right? Joseph, God says, Joseph, I'm going to, your, your family's going to bow down to you. You're going to be, you know, honored and you're going to be ruler and all this good stuff. Oh, by the way, to do that, let me tell you a little secret. See, God doesn't tell us all the steps because if we had to know all the steps, we'd be out. <laughs> right? Like, if I had to know all the steps, I'd be like, I don't think so. That doesn't sound like a good plan, even though that's a good destination. And Abraham discovered who God was. And, and here's what we like to do, like, even this story in and of itself. Like, who is God that he would say to Abraham, offer your son as a sacrifice? That's a sick God. Because what we do is we, we jump into this, like, one little the portion and like, like okay, we're going to characterize God off of one instance. 
We're going to characterize who God is off of, off of this one thing. And Abraham's not in there off of one thing. This isn't the first time Abraham's heard from God. So Abraham knows I can trust him. And God himself will provide the lamb. As Abraham is walking up the mountain, he's like, I don't know how this is all going to go down, but I know that God is good. I know that God is going to bring this about to my favor. I know that God has promised, and he who does not lie will come through for my life. And so, look, I'm leaving things open to what God can do. Like, I don't know how, the, I don't know how this is going to work, but I know that God will provide the lamb. Like he's just said, he said, I gotta let go. I'm I'm plunging in. I'm jumping right now and I'm in free fall. Woo! Do I need a different microphone? And so Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb. And, and, and so we let go and begin to trust God and know that God is good, that God is able, will come through. And he will do what God can do. And so they reach the place where God had told them about. Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood. He gets ready, takes the knife out, and God says, stop. And Abraham's like, Whew, I knew God would come through. And you know what Hebrews says about this moment? Abraham believed God to the point that had he plunged the knife into his son, that God could raise him back to life again. Like Abraham, this guy is solid in his faith. Like, I don't understand it, but I know that God is good, and I know that God's got a way out of this thing, and I'm jumping all the way in. I'm not holding back. I'm going to, whoo, let's go. And so, so that's the Abraham, because you ain't going to do that unless you know the power of letting go. Unless you know how good it is to trust in a God who is good. And, it, and there's so much frustration that comes from trying to control our own outcomes, trying to manipulate all the details, trying to make everything right just so that it can, I, I'm going to twist that person, I'm going to manipulate that one, I'm going to control this thing. And then, ah, it didn't work again. And at some point, God's saying, jump, trust me. Get all the way in. Step off that ledge. And so, so Abraham does that. And here's what God says to Abraham. Now I know that you fear God. This isn't like I'm terrified of God. If God didn't answer me, he'd smite me. Like so we have this idea that God is upstairs with lightning bolts. The moment you screw up, got him. Yes. He screwed up again. Oh, it's so fun. I got him again. Tripped him up. Woo! That's not how God's doing it. God says, I know the plans that I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans for a hope and a future. When you are in the middle of Babylon and you've been kicked out of your home city and you've been displaced and everything's gone to hell all around you, God has a good plan for your life. But you just say, look, God, I'm going to trust in you. I'm going to step out. I'm going to follow you. And I know I've had past disappointments. I got to let go of that. And I'm going to trust that you can see around the corners. And Jesus, take the wheel. And that's, that's where he says, now I know that you fear God it's not that God's going to shoot a lightning bolt at you. It's that you recognize that God is above all things. That's what the fear of God is. It's not fear and trembling. It's honor. Like, I put God first. That's what it means to fear God. I honor God above all else. He's the one whom I hold on to. He's the one in whom I trust. And he's the one whom I will follow. It isn't that we follow out of fear. We follow out of love. Perfect love casts out all fear. See, when you know who God is, you don't, you're not afraid of God because God sent his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. This is the kind of God we serve. This is the kind of love that is lavished on us that we live in that kind of love. And so at the end of all of this, 
there's this verse in verse 17, because you didn't withhold your son, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Here's what you need to know about this. We're going to wrap it up right here. I get the tam- team to come back. This is, if you are willing to trust God and let go, you're going to give birth to more in the future than you lost in the past. That, that if you would be willing to trust him, like it's this that big test moment, like this is that big test moment. God came to test Abraham. And I believe that God's here today to test our faith. God wants to know what you're holding on to. God wants to know, and, and his invitation to you today is to jump. Like let go, surrender that to God. If you're still holding on to that stuff, you're not gonna, you're not gonna make it. If you're still trying to work out all the reasons why, God, why, 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 if you're trying to work through all of that, it's not gonna work for you. But if you would be willing to jump, like if you'd be willing to, as God is testing your faith, He's going he's gonna to ask you for some things, and maybe it's your finances. Maybe it's your relationship. My, my wife was talking about surrendering her marriage. She's not giving up on me. She's just saying, I'm going to trust God for me, that I cannot be the source of her happiness. Like, as, look, I'm a good husband, but I'm not that good. Like, I, I can't take the place of God in her life. That God comes first. God has to come first in our relationship. And at some point, we begin to worship the relationship over the one who gave it to us. We'll we'll worship that relationship and say, oh, I'll be happy because, God, if you ever took my wife from me, of course, that would be terrible. I'd have to trust God. God that I got a joy that the world didn't give and the world cannot take it away. We can't always understand God's plans and his processes. We don't understand how God works and how God moves. But if you will be willing to let go, God will release something beautiful in your life that, that whatever you had to let go of, you're gonna give birth to more of in the future. There's just something that's going to come when you let go of it. When you step out in faith, there's going to be more. There's going to be blessing. It's not about your past. You hold on to that past. It'll keep you stuck in the past. You let go of that and step into the future. I was in New York City on September 11th of 2001. One of the, I was deeply wounded by, on that day. As I watched the the towers fall. And I, you just, you're like, I, I remember hating so bad the terrorists and, and hating really Muslims in that moment. And there's this really interesting story that, that comes out of, out of September 11th of 2001. There's a, there was a young couple who was getting ready to get on a flight in their, their on the way to the airport and the tire on their car blew out. And so they're changing the, the, the nuts on the tire and they're trying to get to the airport and they missed their flight. And that flight was one of the flights that flew into one of the, one of the towers. So their lives were spared and their father, who was in New York City, he was a fireman in New York City, called frantically and got a hold of his kids, this young couple, and said, hey, are you okay? And they said, yeah, and, and they were rejoicing. And they didn't know it. That was the last time they would speak on the phone. The father hung up the phone and was called in to the World Trade Center. And so as, as he's there, the tower collapsed and he died. And so they were like so confused because God spared them and they were believers, and they were, they were distraught because they couldn't understand, like, why would God spare us? We know Jesus, but they weren't sure that their father knew Christ. 
Well, a couple of months later, they, they get a knock on the door at their house, and there's a young couple that's standing at, at the door with a, a, a young, small baby. And they said, you know, we, we wanted to come and introduce our child to you. <clears throat> when we were, the, the wife was seven months pregnant at the time that the tower collapsed. And, and she said that your father came up and rescued me. He carried me down. I don't know the number of stairs, but on the way down, as he was carrying this seven-month pregnant woman down these flights of stairs, she shared with him the love of Christ. When he got to the bottom of the steps, he knelt on his hands and knees and accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And she said, I, I wanted you to meet. I wanted you to meet our son, we named him after your father. And I wanted you to know that he is spending eternity in heaven. Listen, we can't understand how all of this stuff works together. We don't understand how God works and orchestrates events. But what I want you to know is that there is a God who is good, who is working on your behalf when you're willing to let go when you're willing to, to trust in him, in this God who is good, who will never leave you, who will never forsake you, and when you are willing to, to like all of the grief and all of those things, I'm just gonna, like I'm gonna leave that in the past. You're gonna give more birth to more in the future than you've ever lost in your past. So here's what I wanna do this, this morning. I want every head to bow, every eye to close. We're gonna, we're gonna wrap it up right here. We're going to have this moment to respond. I want you to be able to, to take some time this morning to kind of sort through your heart. Sort through your mind and, and discover what it is that you believe about God. Are you willing? Are there some things that you've been holding on to that you need to surrender? Are, is there an area of your life? Is it your relationships? Is it your finances? Is it, is it your past hurts? Is there... There's some things that you need to let go and give to God. Well, here's what we're going to do with every head bowed and every eye closed. In a couple moments, what I want you to do, if you know that's you, you're ready to surrender some things to God, we're going we're gonna to dismiss. There's going to be prayer teams that are going to come up on the left and on the right, and we're going to have this opportunity to sing. And this room right here, I want to invite you. If you know that you're ready, you need to let some things go, and you need to pray. This room right here is going to become that place for you to do business with God, to surrender, to let go. And then if you're here today and you, you've never engaged in a relationship with Jesus and you know like, hey, if you were to die today, you don't know where your eternal destination is. But you've heard about a God that loves you with an everlasting love and, and he is going to redeem you and he's going to make you new and you know you're ready to surrender your life to that God. You're going to trust him. You're going to jump in this morning with every head bowed and every eye closed. If that's you. I just want you to slip your hand up and say, I'm ready to surrender my life to Jesus. I'm going to begin a relationship with him today, giving him my life. Go ahead and slip your hands up right now all over the room. And surrendering your life to Jesus, and giving him your all. I see your hand over here. Anybody else, this hand right here. Anybody else is surrendering their life to Jesus this morning? All right, with every head bowed and every eye closed, you can put your hands down, this hand over here. All right, what we're going to do is we're going to all pray this simple prayer together. It's just a prayer of surrender. We're going to invite God to come and lead us and to guide us. And as we do that, the Bible says we'll become brand new. So. Let's pray this together. Everybody out loud so nobody has to pray by themselves. Lord Jesus, I come to you today just as I am. I surrender my life to you. I know that you died and rose again for me. You took my place. You showed me great love. I want to follow you. I give you my life. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, everybody. Put your hands together for everybody that just made that decision.